السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الأمين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين We begin with the praise of Allah We ask Allah to send his peace and blessings upon his final messenger Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Upon his family, his companions and all those who follow his way into the day of judgment We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us amongst them Alhamdulillah, I'd like to welcome you all to the first lesson uh, for uh, Arabic 101 uh, Brought to you by Islamic Learning Foundation Covering the Revelation Revealed uh, Curriculum, Access to Quranic uh, Arabic. Inshallah, in this first lesson, we will be covering uh, these major topics. Uh, first, we'll kind of introduce you to the Arabic language and the various Ar um, components of the Arabic, um, studying and the Arabic language. <coughs> then, we'll go immediately into the parts of speech that we find in the Arabic language um, and uh, signs of the ism. Uh, as well as a quick overview of the fi'l and the harf, inshallah. And if you haven't figured it out already, you will soon that there are three uh, parts of speech in the Arabic language, which is the ism, the fi'l, and the harf. But before we go into the uh, main lesson, I wanted to make sure that everyone's on the same level uh, with regards to uh, common uh, Arabic script terminology. Um, some of us may come from Indo-Pak uh, backgrounds and uh, consequently we may have different terms that we learned uh, these different signs. Um, so with regard to um, Fatha, Fatha is when you have the, uh, the mark above the letter. Okay, so that, that is a Fatha. If it's below, it's a Kasra, right? Kasra. If it's that wow looking letter or sign, it's called Dhamma. And then tanween is when you have the double, right? So when you double it up, that's called tanween. The whole thing is called tanween, okay? <clears throat> so this is a common terminology that I want us all to be aware of um, so that everyone's on the same page. So if you look at the Arabic language, um, there are four major uh, components of study. The first major component is al-lugha or al-kalimat. Um, these uh, al-lugha or kalimat is refer referring to the actual language itself or referring to the vocabulary. So when, when we're studying Arabic language, vocabulary development is a critical, if not the most fundamental and foundational uh, element of um, studying any language, of course. Um, the rest of the sciences are learning how to put that vocabulary together to make sense. So um, the first thing, uh, inshallah, when, when we're studying uh, together, inshallah, you'll find that uh, we'll be building our vocabulary uh, through our readings, through our courses, through our discussions in class, um, uh, and, and, and inshallah, we'll be learning how to put them together through this, uh, these other um, sciences here. So the next um, science is an-nahu, right? An-nahu is um, commonly translated as grammar. Um, I, I don't think it's necessary for us to uh, remember the names or the English translations of technical terms. Okay, so there are technical terms that we will learn uh, together. Um, but, and, and sometimes I'll give the English uh, translation if it helps us understand what that technical, ter technical term means. Um, but because it is a technical term, I want us to be familiar with the actual Arabic term, which is an-nahu, okay? So what nahu is, basically, it's the study of arranging of words so that they make sense. So you take individual words, you put them together um, to form phrases or sentences. Um, and there are rules that regulate that. How do you put them together? How can they be arranged uh, in order to make sense? <clears throat> also, al-nahu uh, goes hand in hand with this science right here, or this study right here, the study of i'rab. I'rab basically uh, is the grammatical state of each word. Uh, basically what the i'rab does is it identifies the function of the, the word in the sentence. And that function or that grammatical state is um, uh, presented externally or it's displayed with the ending of the word. So we may ask ourselves, why does a word, uh, why, why do we, why could we have a word that says al-kitabu, right, al-kitabu, or al-kitaba, right, ba, and al kita Right? This ending, the ending of the word here, these different marks, right? The Dhamma, the Fatha, Dhamma, Fatha, and Kasra. These endings are basically um, indicators of the um, state, the function of the word in the sentence. And that state or function of the word is, as well as the sign that is presented um, with, with it, 
is essentially um, what we call i'rab, the function of the word in determining its grammatical state and how that grammatical state um, uh, is displayed at the end of the word. Okay? That is the study of nahr. As-sarf. As-sarf is basically taking root words, uh, root verbs, all right? T most commonly three-letter root verbs and morphing them. It's commonly, as-sarf is commonly translated as morphology. So you morph them or you change them into other forms in order to bring other meanings. So when it comes to as-sarf, we have this word we've talked about, uh, we can, uh, we've talked about before. <coughs> Is star right is a rain star with a sukun fi ra is tafira. So is tafira the sarf right explains that this uh, explains this form of a word. It, first of all, we learn we'll learn through sarf that the first that this word is tafira is tafira. Um, I'm sorry, is tafira as of. I'm sorry, istaghfara with the fa, right with the uh, fatha. So istaghfara um, gives the meaning number one. That you, you take the meaning of the the root verb, um, the root verb of istaghfara is ghafara. So ghafara. So the three-letter root word of istaghfara is ghafara, which means he forgave. So we know there's something to do with forgiveness here. What we learn in Sarf is that because it has this scene in the ta in the beginning, it gives an element of seeking. So you're seeking something. What are you seeking? Seeking ghafara, seeking forgiveness. But who is seeking the forgiveness? Well, the form is istaghfara, right? Indicates that is he is seeking. He, right? He is the one. He's the subject, okay? Because of the form, we, we recognize that it's he. And then the, the fact that we have this fatha here indicates that it's past tense. So the actual, this one word in the Arabic language is actually a sentence, which is, he sought forgiveness, right? In the past, okay, past tense. So this is what Nasarf will teach us, inshallah, how to make, and if you learn the root words and you learn all the various forms that the root words can make, then you can take one root word, you can learn root words, and then you can build an entire dictionary of a vocabulary, inshallah. The last uh, science, inshallah, is al-balagha, and al-balagha is basically <clears throat> the heightened uh, form of which um, you use language, right? So you can see a number of things, let's say in the English language, number one uh, is, you know, he is like a beast, right? You can say he is like a beast, right? This liking, right? this is the study of like sim uh, similes and metaphors. So you can say he is like a beast. That's one way you can say it. It makes sense according to Nahu and it makes sense according to vocabulary. But you can also say he's a beast. A beast. Excuse my handwriting. All right. He is a beast, right? So both of these are, this is one level of like metaphor. And then this is the highest level, right? There's one level of comparison. This is the highest level of comparison. So to say he's a beast, man, he's a beast, is a much more powerful uh, expression than he is like a beast, right? So in the Arabic language, similarly, you'll learn nahu, how to put words together, but you'll find that uh, al-balagha teaches us that, okay, there are many different ways that words can be put together to make sense, to have meaning, but which way is the best way? And this is where the al-balagha is where the Qur'an excels, and this is where you really get the sweetness of the Qur'an. Although you'll get the sweetness of the Qur'an through this, as well as this, right? But the balagha is where it really excels. <clears throat> so when we continue to uh, map the Arabic language, um, a lafth is basically pronunciation, when you articulate or to make sounds. Lafth can be without meaning. Okay, don't worry too much about the terminology here, okay? Without meaning, right? Or with meaning. al Muldur, okay? And so the focus of language is on this component, right? So language, language is meaningful speech. So al mawdur is broken up into two parts. You have single words that make sense, and then you have when you put the single words together to make compounds. So mufrad is single, right? And murakkab is compound, 
okay, compounds, putting multiple singulars together, okay? And then muraka breaks down into naqis and tem. Naqis means incomplete, okay? Incomplete, oopsies, and complete. All right, so, and then don't worry about these ones right here, okay? But you can have incomplete sentences and complete sentences, okay? So there are many, there are dozens of incomplete sentences, okay? But basically, <coughs> sentences, uh, words that are put together, don't, don't make a complete message as of yet. <coughs> then you have complete sentences, you have jumla, these are called jumla, tam is also known as jumlatun, right? Jumla. Jumlatun, okay? And you have jumlatul ismiya and jumlatul fi'liya. So you have sentences that are start with an ism, which we'll talk about in just a moment, and sentences that begin with the fi'l. And there are certain nahu rules that relate to both of those. All right, so bismillah. So as far as um, uh, parts of speech, so this is the real content that is important for us to understand. <coughs> that uh, in the English language, there are actually eight parts of speech. All right, and I find this to be helpful because sometimes when you're maybe struggling to understand the three parts of speech in Arabic language, um, well, you'll, you'll see that there, there are eight in English and um, there are three in Arabic. So there has to be some type of uh, correlation between the two. So you have uh, in English language, which is a basic um, review, you have nouns, which are person, places, or things. Car, book, apple, you know, those are, those are nouns. Then you have pronouns. Pronouns. Um, include he, right, she, they, you. These are basically uh, words that replace nouns. They replace them, okay? Then you have an adjective. An adjective is a word that describes a noun. Describes a noun. The fast car, right? The fast car, right? The car. The fa fast is the um, adjective and is describing the noun, which is a car. Then you have adverb. An adverb is, an, is a word that describes everything else. So adjectives describe Nouns and adverbs describe everything else, including adjectives, adverbs, and verbs. And here's some examples. So um, the fast car, okay, fast is an adjective. Where is the adverb in this sentence? Very fast, the very fast car. Well, the adverb is very. What is it describing? Fast, which is the adjective. And the adjective is describing car, okay? Um, came quickly. Came is the verb, right? Quickly. What's quickly? Quickly is an adverb. It's describing the verb. Came very quickly. Actually, both of these are adverbs. Very is an adverb that describes an adverb, which describes came. Okay? So that is um, uh, wh where we're at as far as an adverb is concerned. So a verb. A verb is an uh, action that is connected to time, past, present, and future. Preposition, conjunction, particle. So a preposition is basically a word um, that um, brings out attributes of a noun related to time, place, or direction. Time, place, or direction. So from, to, on, below. So the, this is the key right here, time, place, direction. Okay. Conjunction, junction, what's your function, as we talked about, uh, are basically wor uh, words that connect sentences, phrases, or words together. Right. The boy um, bought a toy and candy. So and, or, but, rather. These are words that can connect words, phrases, or sentences together. And the last one is a particle, which is a, an, or the. There are only three particles, okay? So there are eight parts of speech in the Arabic language, I'm sorry, in the English language. And here we go. There are only three. So what are the three? Boom, ism, 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 ism. Fi'l and harf. All right? If you forgot, if you forget all of this, if this is too much of a re review of English grammar. Don't worry about it. What's most important is this. Ism fi'l harf. There are three types of speech in, uh, in the Arabic language. And what we're going to do is break down each of these different types of speech, um, f starting with the ism. How do we understand? How do we recognize an ism? And what are the rules regarding ism? And how do we put isms together to form sentences? Okay? So there are signs that indicate that a word is an ism. And this will help us, inshallah, with identifying... Um, this will help us identify, um, uh, a, you know, what the ism is so that we can, inshallah, uh, be able to um, recognize the rules surrounding it. So the first indication of an ism is that it has tanween. All right. So tanween, remember what we said is the double letters, right? Muslimun. Muslimun. 
this is tenuin, okay? Mus limun, okay? How do you turn, uh, what, when you see a word with tenuin, what does it mean? It means indefinite. We'll talk about that later, inshallah, indefinite. What does indefinite mean? Uh, well, there's a difference between indefinite and indefinite. But most importantly, it usually means yeah, it starts with the letter A. So muslimun means a Muslim. A. A Muslim. Uh, the second sign of an, uh, of an ism is that you st you have alif lam. Alif lam, you can, take, you can take muslimun and turn it and you add alif lam to it and it has a couple of changes. Firstly, you add alif lam and then you take away the tanween. So it becomes al muslimu. And the meaning now becomes, it becomes definite. And what does that mean? Definite. We'll talk about that in more detail later. But basically, it gives the meaning the. The Muslim. Okay? That's another sign. So you can take any word, any ism, you can have its indefinite form and its definite form. Every single ism has an a and a the form. Okay? And then the last uh, the last two signs, or the last sign here at least, uh, the major sign is that you have tamarbuta. Tamarbuta basically is an indication of femininity. Okay, so you can take the word Muslim and you add a tamarbuta at the end and it becomes muslimatun, al-muslimatu and muslimatun, which basically indicates that this is a female Muslim, right? So tamarbuta is an indication of femininity, okay? And the last um, sign is one I'm not going to go into too much detail here is al-jar. This is the grammatical state. This is al-i'rab. This is ready to al-i'rab, okay? This is related to al-i'rab, okay? And um, the, the most common sign of this, the i'rab or the grammatical state jar is that it has a kasra. So words that end with kasra, if it's not for pronunciation purposes, for tajweed purposes, it can be with tanween or without tanween. If it has a kasra at the end, it's an indication that it's in the state of jar. And what that tells you is that there's a reason why it's in the state of jar. There's a function of that word that puts it in that, to that state. So just um, for a quick a recap of, or quick um, review of uh, the fi'l, okay? Um, we're going to go back into this when we start studying uh, verbs later. Is there are um, four major types of fi'l. Um, the first is that it's past tense, right? You want to know its past tense form. You want to know its present tense form. So past, present. And then the amr is command what's the command form and then what's the negation term like how do you say don't do so and so don't do whatever it is negation so kataba means to write or it's speci more specifically it means he wrote literally okay kataba means he wrote in the past tense al madi how do you change kataba to the present tense well you add this ya you change the tattoo dhamma so it becomes yaktub and then dhamma Yaktubu. Kataba, he wrote. He is writing. Yaktubu. Present tense. All right. There's a way to do future tense, which is very easy. You just add a set before it or a sofa. That's how you add it, make it future tense. Sofa, yaktubu, sa yaktubu. And then, um, oktub. Oktub is the form when you're speaking to, to somebody in, uh, in directly. You can only give a command to someone who's directly in front of you. So, uktub means write, or what we are commonly familiar with, iqra is another form for qara'a, iqra. You have a sukun, that's a sukun at the end, iqra, it comes from qara'a, which means he read, qara'a, he read, iqra, right, that's a command that we hear in Surah Al-Iqra, right. And then la taktub. La taktub is the form to say do not write. But I want you to write this down. It's not my real command. And uh, then the harf. So there, so now that we learn what ism is, a fi'l, a harf is, there are two types of harf. There's a harf amil and there's a harf ghayru amil. Basically a harf that works, that affects the grammatical state of the word that comes after it. And a uh, harf that does not affect the grammatical state. So you're going to find huruf al-jar, huruf al-nasib, 
huruf al jazim, right? These are huruf that basic huruf al jar is a harf that turns the word after it into the state of jar. That's why we have b. For example, b bismillah, bismi, b. B is a harf jar. This is ism, the seen and mean, but it's actually ism. So bismi. Why is it e? Because the back came before it. That's a ba, a harf jar, right? Huruf al nasib, like in Allah, in Allah, right? In Allah, in Allah. Why does it have a fatha at the end? Well, because it's in the state of nasab. Why is it in the state of nasab? Because it is follow, follows the inna. Okay, so that's. And then huruf jazim is jazim is only for verbs, and so don't worry about that, inshallah. So lam yaktub, like he did not write. That's what it means. But uh, inshallah, this is a, a a great introduction to inshallah our um, uh, understanding of the parts of speech. And I hope inshallah this was helpful for you. Uh, lesson two, we're going to go into um, the four qualities of the ism. And we're going to start to build our ism, our mufradat, which are the singular words, starting with the ism, and learning how to put them together in, in phrases and sentences, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.